Yo, what's good, y'all? This is Dr. Morris, aka Dr. Digital, and we are in the Teacher's Lounge, where educators do amazing things. And right now, today, I got your boy, my long childhood friend, Dr. Levin there. What's up, man? How you doing, baby? It's good. Good to see you, say. You know what I'm <laughs> Shout out to the 919, baby. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Night, Dale. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, man? Man, I can't call it, man. Life is great. Yeah, you looking nice, preppy and everything. Yeah, Ready sounds to teach. like you when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> man, you know, I'm just still collecting teacher's checks, man, you know. <laughs> Minimum wage, man. <laughs> <laughs> Minimum wage. <laughs> but it's good to see you, man. Welcome to the Teacher's Lounge, man. We do a podcast. Mm-hmm. We talk about educators doing amazing things and incredible things in the classroom. Mm-hmm. You are an educator, no matter how much you try to deny it. You are an educator, my man, because you teach college courses, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where? A&T. A&T. We're going to put a pin in that one. Shout out to the A&T. Shout out to the Aggies. You know what I'm saying? But we're going to put a pin in that because um, first things first, we got to talk about how you got there, right? So tell me a little bit about you, your background, mm-hmm. what you do now, because mm-hmm. you do some dope stuff now. I, I'm not going to go past it. <laughs> you do some amazing stuff now, bro. So uh, give us a little background about who you are, uh, where you from, what field do you specialize in, and you know, tell me a little bit about what you do now. All right. So, but yeah, I'm from North Carolina. Grew up with you. What are you talking about? You know where I'm from. <laughs> I mean, everybody else don't know. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I got to put it out there real quick. But no. Nah, so I guess... To start out, so like I said, I'm from North Carolina. We went to high school together. Then, but after high school, I left and went to Norfolk State. So there, that's when I went to pursue my degree in engineering, optical engineering, to be exact. So after I finished there, I actually stayed and um, attained my master's in material science and engineering. Mm. So You're dropping bars already. <laughs> okay. Then after that, I like, well, cool. Let me go back to. North Carolina with my family at or whatever. And so when coming back, that's when I um, started my PhD at A&T for, at, in nanoengineering. But then now I'm here in Winston. Well, let's back up a little bit because I don't know what optical engineering is, even though I'm in the tech field. But what is optical engineering? So, I mean, it's, it's funny. It's, it's broad. So, because you could think of optics as far as like uh, your eyes, that's optics. But I think what I worked on specifically was more so with working with lasers okay. in particular. So I did a lot of research on basically some of my research on was like, remember that uh, Harry Potter mo- movie where he had, had that scene where they uh, put this cloth on top of him look like he was invisible? Yeah. That's what type of material I worked on. So it's called basically, it's called metal material. And what it does is it bends light. So it makes, mm-hmm. it, makes it like you... What you're really seeing is what is behind the person. That's dope. I need that for myself so I can look skinny. <laughs> then I don't, they, I don't <laughs> think it works that way. <laughs> I need that for myself, <laughs> bro. But um, that's dope, man. What was the other one? You said optical engineering, and what was the uh, material science? Material science. So, so, uh, so that's my um, master. So basically, it's almost like I took them both opt- optics and materials and put them together. So that's what that was. Okay, so it's more or less like the practical appliance of what you were learning before. To, to some extent, yes. Okay, that's dope, man. Okay, and nano engineering, what, what's that about? I think they're all related on, to, to, to some extent, because uh, going there, I was doing the same exact research, but using um, uh, different instruments, per se. So there, I wasn't using lasers, per se. I was using this thing called MBE, molecular beam epidactyl. What? Uh, yeah. So, it what happens is you'll build this material with different types of substrates or whatever. Yeah. And you shoot uh, photons off of it, and it's almost like uh, you shoot it off. It's almost like playing that game. What was that old Nintendo game where you had like uh, some, one person be on this side and you slide and hit the ball? Oh, back with and the board. ball, the ping pong yeah. joint. Yeah. Okay. So it's almost something like that, but you. Sh- when it refracted, you wanted to see what type of pattern you was going to get. Oh, that's dope, bro. That's a lot of math in there, huh? Yeah. 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 But you the man, though. And when I ask that question, it's because when I say you the man, you've always been the man. Let's be clear. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I got to give you a flowers with do, bro. I'm going to go ahead and do it now. But in middle school, you was the legend. You know what I'm saying? Zevelin. Zevelin, shout out to Zevelin. Man, you was the man. Here. I'm talking I'm going to do it anyway. He modest. Yo, my boy had... 
scholarships out of nowhere in middle school. I'm talking about sports. He was the man. Basketball, he's the man. Football. NC State came through one time, gave him an autograph. What was the what was the coach name? Chuck Amato. Chuck Amato, bro, with the raspy <laughs> boy. Hey, would you come over there? My man was down there. And then you went up to um went to high school together. Mm-hmm. Um right after middle school and, and you was the man there, especially on both sides. Education, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Education. And then of course you didn't play football. And uh, the only man I know to this day at nose tackle, boy, with abs. They, they, <laughs> they, they season sex, boy. <laughs> but speed kills, man. But, yeah, you say. know, but talk about your um, – you was in a lot of educational programs, too, in, in, in high school. Yeah, so I was in – so they had – the first one I started out with it was called Trio. It's mm-hmm. some – program through NC State, but that's the main one. It was called Upper Bound. Yeah. Whatever. Upper so what fun. that that was actually really great. So what it did was uh and it started in high school. So it helped basically prepare you for college. That's mm-hmm. that was the main purpose of it. And I think it did really well. And also gave you opportunities to take uh college visits that's depending on your family economic situation, they allow you to do some things that you that you couldn't do otherwise. Okay. Okay. But now you um, you got your doctorate. Yeah. You out here a professor, you know, saying Dr. Levin there, as you, if you will. So what um, what classes do you kind of teach now? And, you know, um, you say A&T, right? Yeah, math. That's it. Math? That's, that's it, just math. Uh, okay. So, like, calculus, uh, algebra, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Okay. But you, you, um, you did something really uh, different now. You made a shift change in your career? Yeah, so I made a complete career change. So now I'm a, a business intelligence engineer. God, that boy, that boy get that bad boy. Business <laughs> intelligence engineer. So tell me about that. What's that, what's that about? So the, I mean, I guess as far as like uh, engineering, it's, it's still there to some extent, but more so I'm working on a lot of data. Mm. For instance, for instance, so let's say you have a company or whatever, but you have all this data and you want it to know, hey, uh, where am I, uh, how am I doing as far as like either sales or it doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter if it's sales or your on-time delivery for whatever product you have. So what I do is I f- dig through all this data and using different types of applications and give you the answers you're looking for based off reports. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's almost like an analyst, but it's not in a sense, because I build application analysts search through data. I, I kind of do okay. both. Okay. So you hybrid. Yeah. But thank you for explaining the difference between the two, because I know a lot of people don't know the difference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, um, so with that being said, do you you kind of taught yourself how to do that? Yeah, everything. We ain't gonna skip that. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I didn't go to school for every all that all my BI experiences, all of it self taught. Okay. So I taught. We just go. We just go ahead like that's normal on a regular on a regular <laughs> Tuesday. Is what we're gonna do. How long yeah. did it take you to, to learn that? So I mean, when I sat down, so I started doing it for like I would say. Like total, like five years ago, but I didn't really like buckle down mm-hmm. to like the last three and start. And that's when I got with this last company I was with, it was called uh, Tempest Elite. Then there, I got hired on to do one thing, mm-hmm. but I showed my skill set in another way. I was like, all right, cool, this is what I want to do. So they pretty much like, hey, we're going to let you run wild and do this right here. What made you want to make that change? Money. I feel you, boy. <laughs> Welcome to the teacher's lab. That that bag would talk to you. I feel you. That's what's up, man. So, um, do you see yourself doing it, like you know, years out from now? Or? Uh, yes. And the reason reason being is because with this type of in this particular field, as long as your brain is sharp, you always have a job. I'm right now dropping bars. I like that, bro. And it's not like I have to, I mean, you can compete, or I mean, definitely you compete with others, but it's like, I wouldn't call it job security, but if you look, if you just go Google right now, jobs for business intelligence engineers or something like that, there's tons of them. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you have to have a a ton of experience per se, but some will start you out fresh out of college, so it's 
depends on what you want to do, man. What do you think about high school? You think kids in high school could learn something like this? And yeah, easy. easy. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I think anyone can learn. Like, I teach my my son. Well, it's not that I teach him, hey, this is how you code, but, like, in order for him to get on his uh, gaming computer, like, hey, you got to give me 15 minutes of typing, you got to give me 15 minutes of coding. He mm. thinks he's just playing games. That's dope. But he's yeah. learning how to code and type faster. Wow. And y'all build that together, right? From what I understand? Uh, so the, the um, idea was to build together, but I actually ended up building by myself so I could make sure it worked for Christmas. Mm. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think it's really dope that you provide, like, you know, I guess you would say uh, not only just parenting structure, but mm-hmm. um, technical structure for him, you know? Yeah, because, I mean, don't get me wrong, uh, teachers... They do the best they can with what they have, but at the end of the day, they got too many too many kids in their classroom. So it's mm-hmm. like I'm not gonna leave my child's, uh, I guess, education in, in in hands of his teacher when I know I can do it myself. Right. So. I feel that. I feel that. But I, and I think that's important because, um, <clears throat> you know, there's been a lot of stipulation about teachers or educators. Um, you know, being stuck, if you will, I hate to use the word stuck, but you know, that's the term they use, to be stuck with um, the child all day and the parents do nothing. I agree. You know, and you, uh, you, take, you take full advantage of, of really ad- adopting that structure and helping your son outside yeah. the classroom. Yeah, because like, you, hey, you can ask this teacher, it's like, they'll send homework home. It's like two or three problems. Like, man, if you don't send this man some more homework home, mm-hmm. she's like, you want more? Like, yeah. Yeah, like, how do you think you get better practice? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you're, you're definitely, you know, one of one of few that kind of take on that practice as a parent at home. But you obviously do have the upper advantage because you, you know, you thrive in certain fields, and the structure you provide is a little more intense than most households. I would agree. Yeah. So with that being said, how do you, where do you think students are now, or where they can be? if educators use the right structure of technical methodologies, if you will, in the classroom for students like you do at home? Uh, so it, it, it depends. Uh, and I guess if, I guess if I'm answering your question correctly, are you asking me how does, how could technology help a teacher in the classroom? Well, yeah, on that component as well, but also like, you know, taking a more deep dive approach on um, not only can, how can it help in the classroom, but how can it help students in career wise coming out of high school? It could help if they knew what they was trying to do, but that's kind of hard to ask, uh, was it, when you graduate, what, six, 17, 18? Mm-hmm. To say, hey, what it is that you want to do. Mm-hmm. You think them being exposed? I mean, yeah, them being exposed, yeah, will, will be great or whatever. But to ask them, hey, this is this is what you want to do. Let's go do this. That mm-hmm. I, I think that's unfair because the reason I say that, hey, I'm 35 and I just changed careers. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like, true. I mean, to get them exposed, so it's like this right here. Mm-hmm. If you're exposed into it, those who want to will. Mm-hmm. And so and then you take and you weed out from there. So could it be a good thing to answer your question? Yes. But I wouldn't try to force it on the body if this is not what they want to do. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah, I'm a firm believer in that a child should explore and yeah. look and see where they want to, where, where they best fit at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but let's just say for the technical, let's just say for this particular moment right now, we're only talking about kids that are interested in tech. Mm-hmm. Um, how how do you think is or what do you what 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 strategies do you think is the best way to get these kids exposed into digital literacy the right way and then and then taking that exposure and applying it to work based learning for them coming out of high school? That's that's a good question, but it's still broad. And the reason why I say that is because technology is so wide. Mm-hmm. So either, I mean, do you want someone to be a front-end developer? you want to be a back-end developer? Do you want to just do user interface? Or do you just want someone who just learn do data science? Data science technology, too, because you're coding still. Mm-hmm. So it depends on what it is that they're into to then. But to try to cater 
towards so many kids, it will be, I guess, slightly difficult. But what you could do is, I guess, find that, I guess, find that happy medium or whatever. And whatever that may be, I, have, I don't know. But there, there is one. And go from there. Because you have, you, like you said, you might have kids who love, who um, will love to design a website, but you have the kid, well, I don't want to design it because I'm not good at designing, but I can help you with the back end structure of this. So it depends on what, what is their niche. Yeah. So if you can, <clears throat> let's say, build a course around software development or whatever, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> just from there, you can almost treat it like a college course class because in the very beginning, everybody, all the engineers are taking the same exact math class and they branch out mm -hmm. to their respective um, core classes and take it from there. Yeah, I think, I think what you were speaking about is really, really interesting um, because like for me as an educator, I teach IT foundations or IT fundamentals in the mm -hmm. beginning. And then we cover like five primary pathways of IT, very broad. Right. And then from there, you go into your more respective pathways of technology. Yeah. So perfect example. So you're into cybersecurity. I'm not. Right. So we will, let's say, OK, you say, hey, John, let's come up with something where we can expose kids to, to, to technology. So in the very beginning, like you said, these main, I guess, the foundation classes would be exactly the same. Then they're like, all right, cool. And I became to this point where I. Right, then so when you start figuring out what the kids' real interests are, well, hey, those who want cybersecurity go at Dr. Morris. Those who want to do either back-end development, data science stuff, mm -hmm. come with Dr. Louvenier. So it could work that way also. Yeah, I think, um, I think building the bridge between the two does work. We just got to figure out the strategies on how. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, if we combine, if a lot of people combine forces in the education field, in regards to like, how do we how do we make digital literacy a second language in the classroom? Mm. You gonna have to exposure. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's exposure. But at the but it's, it's exposure and also teachers, because you can't have a teacher who doesn't know anything about it in the classroom. So mm -hmm. it, like, um, let's say if you try to expose it in like elementary or something like that. Do you teachers didn't go to school for this? True. So now you asking them to learn something, to teach something. They were like, this is not what I get paid for and they already don't get paid enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, you're right, you, they do not get paid enough price to be what, bro. But, um, but in the same breath, even with me being an educator there, like times have changed from just the classroom lectures to now like, Pandemic and post-pandemic, now they like they're they're forced to be hybrid. Yeah, I, you know? I agree. But it's forced to be hybrid. That's only forcing them to learn a different way. Mm -hmm. It's not forcing the teacher to learn something new. They're not learning anything new. Okay, Zoom. Yeah. Teams. <laughs> My, not Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's not like they're unless they the schools have a dedicated teacher for it and not mm -hmm. trying to force it upon someone who does do it, mm -hmm. it ain't gonna work because their passion for it isn't there. Okay, I agree. So what do you do with those educators that don't wanna learn? What do you mean they don't wanna learn? I mean, you shouldn't have to force someone to learn something. No, you shouldn't, but if it benefits you into the classroom as far as engagement. Benefits who? The students. Like if you got a class full of students mm -hmm. and all these kids got cell phones and you, the school now has a policy where the cell phones are now like not so much restricted and you asking the teacher, hey, um, why did you use me for example? Let's use me for an example. Okay. I didn't grow up in the eighties and all that as an educator. You know, they they old school, you know what I'm saying? We had those teachers where it was blackboard and pencils and chalkboard. Chalk <laughs> right? The projector string. Oh man, was it was the what was the machine with the little light and they had to change the bulb? Is that what it was? Yeah, that's what it was. Oh, man. <laughs> they had it right up there, the squirt bottles. Oh, man. But now, um, me as an educator, I use like, um, like social media to help me mm -hmm. with the classroom. Like mm -hmm. when kids come in, 
I use like a reel or a story. Mm-hmm. I like, yo, go to the classroom page on Instagram mm-hmm. and answer the questions by posting your answers in there. Mm-hmm. Right? I had to shift from traditional to more of a more urban type learning style mm-hmm. in the classroom. Do you think um, educators should be able to shift into that? As long as they get whatever curriculum across that they're supposed to get, they should be able to do it as freely as they want. I agree. I agree. Especially with the shout out to the Big E curriculum. You can come holler at me. Holler <laughs> <laughs> at me, all school systems. Holler at your boy about the Big E curriculums. But, um, but yeah, I, uh, I got one more question mm-hmm. before we wrap this up. With all the all the discussion that we just had, real quick, was really engaging. I appreciate you coming out mm-hmm. about that and, and dropping some heavy gems in there too. Um, in the next five to ten years, or even maybe fifteen, where do you think education is going to be at with digital literacy being part of this classroom era? So, I mean, to be completely honest, I don't think. I guess once they get this uh, metaverse stuff really going, I don't okay. f- foresee people going to school in metaverse. I don't see that being far fetched. Yeah. For a couple, a couple reasons. One, I, who who knows if another pandemic was going to come through? Two, uh, you got uh, people already scared to send their kids to school because they're going to get afraid to get killed. All these- yeah, there's a lot of violence going on, man. Yeah. So I don't see that being far fetched. Yeah. You think? Um- you think it'll be more like a virtual reality type thing? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. In the household, yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's a good and bad thing. Good thing is, okay, kind of, sorta. You're not really that much concerned anymore about your kid's safety, but their social skills going to go down the drain. Right, social economic learning and oh, all that being just yeah. And I mean, you can see it now on some of the, uh, especially like the younger kids doing like the, uh, pandemic eras. Like even for my son, mm-hmm. those two years was kind of crucial yeah but he had me as a parent i can't say the same for other kids because like you can look some of these kids reading skills are not as good because of, they lost two years mm-hmm. and it's like uh how do you really try to teach somebody how to read through a camera right and, and then try to play catch up when you get back in the classroom yeah it don't work that way yeah yeah so it's a lot of work that needs to be done on both ends of the spectrum, either in the classrooms and then all the way up to the superintendents. Yeah, as at well as, home. It starts at home. Yeah, it does. <laughs> as well as that, too. Yeah. So, you know, both got to be collaborative together, yeah, though. But to answer your question, I think I don't like to see next. I would like to say I wouldn't be surprised people going to school through virtual reality, through the metaverse. Mm-hmm. I would not be surprised. Oh, man, technology's taking over, bro. I was just saying, I told you so. <laughs> well, you told him. I know it's <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But look, man, I uh, I thank you for your time. Mm-hmm. And um, even though you don't want to always admit it, you know, Dr. Louvenaire, you know what I'm saying, to the building. <laughs> I hear in the Teachers, the Teachers Lounge podcast, where great educators do amazing things, man. And I appreciate you coming out, bro. No problem. Thank you so much. I hope you come back on the show again. So we can talk about more about uh, data analytics. All right. All right. <laughs> Yo, Teachers Podcast. Oh, man, the Teachers Lounge Podcast. Appreciate y'all coming out.